Hello. <laughs> I'd like to start by saying it's an honor to be here, first off, and uh, thank you to Johnson Hunt for inviting us to speak. We really appreciate this opportunity to share work with everyone. Um, Johnny has actually participated with us in a few of our projects, and we always look forward to working with her. We are Analog Analog, and we like to think of ourselves as an artist team. And together, we collectively transform gallery spaces into sites for interaction, activity, and play. That sounds fun, right? <laughs> Our projects tend to integrate analog functions with digital technologies, creating a body of work that varies in appearance while having many common threads that run through it. To start is the concept of trust. We set up situations for the viewer to play a part in the art-making process. To do this effectively, trust has to be established in the space. Then, we consider the element of co-authorship in our projects, because we enjoy exploring this bridge that exists between the artist and the viewer, and we're always looking for ways to expand that. We want it to work like a partnership or a public dialogue, where there's a push and a pull that creates the experience. It's also important to create an analogy in the work that models an action or a way of life. We willingly share our personal perspective with the participant through our actions and interactions. For example, in the fall of 2011, we created a two-room installation that embodied these three major elements, trust, co-authorship, and analogy. We invited viewers to share the experience of the artist's brain turning ideas into actions. It was called the artist's living room. People entered the gallery space to, to find a recreated living room with art books, notepads, and pencils, couches, and tables. A small TV was placed on a bookshelf in the space showing an image of billowing fabric. We brought our own personal furniture items in from home because we felt it would lend an authenticity to the room. And visitors were welcome to sit, read, converse, and share ideas. Of course, people can be shy and weary, so getting conversations started in a room full of strangers was a daunting task. The lights were soft, coffee was being brewed and served with homemade cookies, the smell that permeated the air. Comfort was our gesture of trust here. At their leisure, people made their way into the second room to see the walls and ceiling made of fabric and dangling ropes that they could be, that can be pulled and tugged. They could change the shape of this room by pulling the ropes. Pillow pads were scattered on the floor for viewing. Here was their opportunity to take part and co-author the design of the space at will. It wasn't long before people realized that the first room was for talking and this room was for doing. The two rooms were bridged by a live feed video that plays on that small monitor that I mentioned in the front room. It captures the image of the changing object in a subtle yet poetic manner. I like to think of these two rooms as an analogy of the artist's mind and the artistic process. One side holding rational academic theories and the other animated with intuitive, intuitive actions and reactions. Technology brings them both together. So now that I've identified these three major elements that motivate our work, um, trust, co-authoring, and analogy, let's look at more projects that focus on each. Hello. <laughs> I would like to focus on those moments. I would like to further elaborate on those decisive moments of trust, exchange between artist and participant that engages and enables the public to experience our works. In our first collaborative project, we embraced an archaic technology by transforming the gallery into a camera obscura. <laughs> the entrance was blacked out and closed off, redirecting crowds into an unfamiliar, darkened passageway in the rear of the building. The public was informed that they were about to walk into a space that would appear to be pitch black essentially stripping them, their, them their sense of light, sight. But being led in one of the members of our groups, calming instructions were given that if they let their eyes adjust to the dark, soon they would be able to navigate within the space and witness the natural phenomenon of the camera obscura, which was faintly projecting outside imagery onto the walls and the ceiling. Observing the moments before they passed through the black curtain, some were excited, others were nervous, and some turned away. It took them a measure of trust in us in the belief that they would be rewarded by the experience to make them take the next step. Our shows that are more interactive and participatory in nature 
We usually get the, job, the show started, carrying out the actions and encouraging the public to join. Here the trust is enacted over the course of the show by us maintaining the innocent and playful mood and excitement of the experience. Focus group is an excellent example. One gallery room was designated as the focus group for acting out the tasks and actions that were delivered via handwritten messages from the adjoining space. Actions ranged from do the Dougie, to, get on your, to getting on your hands and knees and growling to the public, to tucking in our shirts, to tucking in our shirts. <laughs> um, trust in the playful gesture of this show made Focus Group a success. Often the experiences, experiences that we're trying to bring to people are translations of things that are meaningful in our own lives. The show we lovingly titled Bang On It was definitely inspired by a real moment of tight quartered silence that happened between us. We had all had a long day working and the words were just not there. Someone broke the silence by lightly tapping a beat with their finger on lightly tapping a beat with their finger, and one by one the rest of us joined in, tapping and pounding our own rhythms on something nearby, venting frustrations and reacting to others' responses. This nonverbal form of communication was both beautiful and inspiring. We decided to set up the gallery with, with random objects that we salvaged and assembled that could be used as makeshift instruments and allow our, our visitors the same opportunity to create a concert of communication using objects and sounds without any formal means of choreographing and no way of knowing who would step forward to start. The viewers began interacting wordlessly. People danced and smiled. As the night progressed, visitors joined in more and more quickly. The sounds would ebb and flow, and when a moment of silence surfaced, it would be broken with applause. Then, someone would bang on something and it would start all over again. This unplanned and unscripted collaboration between strangers resulted in an awesome co-authored community dialogue in the form of a digital sound recording, which we offered back to the community through our website. So, following Bang on it, um, another sort of co-authored piece that um, first involved the shared experience fund group uh, was called Cave Paintings. Um, and in it, uh, you know, that shared experience is outdoor adventure. Uh, we spent a day in late June last year, um, sort of slogging around Lake Munson, which at the time had been drained, um, but it was still pretty wet. And uh, all of us were carrying uh, video cameras on us, and as we kind of it's followed our exploratory uh, urges, I guess, um, we took a lot of video of um, sort of first-person perspectives of moving through tall grass and uh, tiny little up-close shots of mushrooms and animals and things like that. Um, we uh, went to a sinkhole and kind of got the you know aquamarine, clear, rippling waters that you find in the really nice ones. And um, over the next night, I basically you know took all that stuff and took the kind of tantalizing clips and made sure that um, across three channels, sort of similar content wouldn't be playing at the same time. And finally, uh, we took back to those three panel channels, rather, uh, onto the walls of our gallery and uh, kind of invited people in uh, and as they kind of stood in front of the videos and they kind of wanted to get this more immersive point of view within it, we offered to trace their silhouettes with paintbrushes. Um, so knowing that you know their, their form would be left on the wall uh, as the night went on, they sort of chose their poses reacting to what was already on the wall, to what they kind of imagined themselves being in the environment, uh, to one another as we can see here, um, and at times you know we may have had to get two or three people up on it while they were kind of holding a pose that was a little challenging. Mm -hmm. This one's not really it. Um, but people would spread out and try to get taller and make sure that they were seen in the piece as the night went on. And uh, see kind of a quiet moment here. And we kind of darkened the temper of paint that we were using to make sure that the different forms are discernible. Um, at the end of the night, we had the viewers slash authors um, who affected the drawing as it finally existed uh, when the lights came up. Another show after that, uh, where viewers left to mark more directly, was called Tape It. And in the latest iteration here at 621 Gallery in Tallahassee, uh, when people came in, they were greeted with all these electrical tape rolls on some nails on the wall, and were welcome to draw whatever they liked on the walls with it. So I kind of started doing uh, these abstract lines and landscapes, um, just kind of establishing broad spots um, with some fairly simplistic drawing. And people came in following and kind of did whatever they liked. 
and uh, people who followed that respond to the earlier sort of drawings that have been put in place. Um, or again, was, was with the previous one, tried to strike out and sort of make their own mark. Uh, whether that was a drawing line or just wanting to sign the name on the wall, um, you know, <laughs> bigger there on the door. Uh, you know, this person's kind of conversing with the uh, sort of floor pattern that was already going on. And then this person kind of used their tape more sculpturally, like as a figure, you know, going up in a line that she saw before. Uh, so we're trying to establish one, one little white spot left over when everyone else had pretty much cleared everything up to about six and a half feet at the end of the night. <laughs> and uh, as an indication of the sort of mood that was going around, I'd never met these guys before. Um, but when the gallery was closing, we kind of invited everyone to take down the tape and to just make it one big sticky ball on the floor. Um, and, so, and I guess, I mean, we have kind of thought of art as something that you know, multiple people can do and invite other people along in. Um, but it was surprising how many people kind of considered art to be you know, sort of a preformed statement in the form of an object from one person to a more or less anonymous object, uh, audience, rather. So uh, that was fun. And uh, the whole time, we had this camera pretty obviously mounted at the back of the room. And uh, it would click every 12 seconds, and we'd make sure to let people know, as part of the trust thing, uh, that they were being photographed. And through that, we had the progression of the evening. Sometimes our shows satisfy a desire in ourselves to dial back technology in the service of reaching the essence of an idea. We do not suffer from technophobia or hate electricity or don't have anything to do with it, but rather we enjoy the simpler means of building and construction. Our piece, We're Fans, revolves around the idea of an analog or a one-to-one -one relationship between two objects or actions. It also plays on our shifting perceptions as we continually revise what we expect from the digital the analog and the mechanical. Viewers entering the gallery uh, on the sweltering night in August 2011 were confronted with two rather large fan-shaped constructions made from locally harvested natural materials, rope, and two large blocks of marble. On the floor in the middle of the space, the next mark the spot where they were invited to stay in the turn. From this location, as they raised their arms, whether left, right, both, quick, slow, 
corresponding fame of lumber into action, creating a moment of unexpected power and agency over this kinetic sculpture. And here's a video in real time about how it works. During this interaction, many viewers would become aware of the camera mounted in the ceiling above the fans. They would begin to speculate as to what sort of digital sensing technology, or gears, or gadgets, or what other motorized shenanigans were up to behind the scenes. They were free to move through the space toward the darkened back gallery where they would discover with much delight that we, the artists, were back there with ropes, pulleys, sweat, and muscle. And that was it. <laughs> They were creating the action in the front room while watching a live video feed of their motions. In laying bare this one-to-one -one correlation between real work and instant gratification, quite a few participants upon seeing in the back curtain became suddenly empathetic and apologized for their exaggerated motions or having too much money, but we still work. And here's the video uh, showing some of those actions. really interesting just seeing how that would shift just by seeing um, what was happening on that other side. But with this project, we, well, excuse me, we wanted to create an analogy that told something about how the entertainment and convenience of our daily lives is built upon the sweat equity of many unseen and unknown people that are laboring in its production. And sometimes those people are behind the scenes, just like we were. Sort of the father of relational aesthetics, so he's the person that coined the term relational aesthetics, which is sort of where our work falls in the art world. That's a quote from him. Um, so I'm, I want to talk about one more project that we've done, and then I want to talk about the projects we're doing. So this is Analog Analog's Knock on Wood, which we um, we had the whole gallery space at 621 in June, um, and this this. Um, with this piece, we're trying to create a community by having people leave their wishes and fears on the wall, and then other people can come behind them and knock on wood for their wishes and fears. So, and they can do that in three ways. The first way is we, we had a, lot, a water oak fall in our yard, and um, then our landlord came and chopped it up with, before we even had a chance to say, wait, no, we're going to use that for art. <laughs> so it got chopped up in our yard, and we, we um, dragged it to the gallery. In a couple trucks, and we made some gavels out of one of the branches. Actually, Shalane made those. Um, and so the gavels were an indicator to the public that they were allowed to knock on wood for the fear, and then the, for the fears and the, and the desires. And then, of course, the show title helped. We usually don't do a lot of signage in our shows, we try, we try and stay a little quiet. We also put these bark pieces on the wall that we had sort of sanded down to make them smoother and sort of more palatable. Um, the rough parts that you can see in the image are really rough and they would actually hurt your knuckles if you were to knock, but then the softer spots we created to give people that opportunity. And in the back of the gallery we hung um, all these crocheted ropes that we made um, and this all out of recycled clothing. And at the top you can kind of see that there's little blocks of 2 by 4 up there. And so when, you're, when you walk through the space, the, the blocks are are knocked together and they make the, the knocking wood sound and it's kind of clacky and sort of musical. It's a different sort of knocking and the other two knockings. 
Um, and then w when we organized the ropes, we did it from the outside in and we made them lighter to darker. So as you walked into the um, into the middle of the rope field, the it would feel more like you were being sort of immersed immersed immer sorry, immersed in something, and the darkness in the center would sort of give it this like quiet, um, peaceful feeling. This is a little um, a video clip of how it sort of moves, how you can see it moving the outside. It was really hard for us to capture how it felt to be in, so we don't even try really. And then while this, is, uh, sorry. while this is playing, I'd like to talk a little bit about our materiality, um, which is on this page. The materials we choose are really important to us. We, we try to choose humble materials, and we try to choose materials that other people are actively trying to give away. So, like the bamboo you saw, and actually the marble too, was, um, was, in, a, was in a scrap pile. And in this case, the, the two by fours were all collected from the wood shops around campus. And, um, you know, in lengths like this that we cut down. So, the lengths were unacceptable to be reused. So, we would we scavenge them. And then the clothing is all donated from the refuge house thrift store and our own personal clothes that we decided we didn't want anymore. Um, and we crocheted them. We washed them in peroxide and baking soda and hung them out to dry on the line so they had that like crisp laundry smell. And also the I come, like we describe our smells, like how our art smells a lot. <laughs> and also the front the front piece that I showed you, the wood, it had a beehive to, beehive in it. So it had this smell of beeswax and honey. It was really inviting. And current, and then I just briefly want to talk about um, what we're up to now. So we're the, currently the resident artist of 61 Gallery, and um, it's the, I don't know if you guys are First Friday goers, but it's sort of in the back of 61, and it's a little bit hidden, so we made this beautiful gray sign that you can find in the square and find us that way. Um, and this recently we did a workshop called Mend It, which we did for Fall Fever just last week. And in this show, we took our own personal clothing items that needed repair, and um, we repaired them either by patching or dyeing or sewing or uh, a couple other things we could do. Um, I don't know. Um, putting two things together, taking, making a dress a shirt, that kind of thing. We did all sorts of stuff, and then, um, and then we invited the the public to come into our space and see what we had made. And, and then the participation with this piece is that the public is, is invited. There's a, there's a sign up sheet, so anyone that's really interested can be invited, and they'll be invited to the next Mended Day. And then also, if you're not interested in that at all, but you do have some clothing, because everybody does, that, want, that you want to have mended, um, we have these mailers. So you can buy a mailer from us and put your clothes in it and send it to us, and we'll do something funny to it and send it back to you. Funny and beautiful. So, um, and then this last project I'm going to talk about is Kaleidoscope, <laughs> and it's also a, one we're workshopping, and we did it for a first Friday in our space. This is actually Shalay looking up into the mirror and making sure that the camera's on. And so we we took we reused our own materials, we salvaged our own materials. So this is these are balls made out of the ropes that we used for knock on wood. That we. We made them into big balls, and then we kind of rolled them into the space. We have like a little ramp entrance, which is convenient for rolling balls. Um, and then we asked people, we had a live feed in the space. You can see the monitor in the back there. And we asked people to help us make a kaleidoscope movie um, by using the balls and their bodies and the monitor to kind of just show like what, what is going on. And then outside the space, we had a live feed up as well through the camera and the ceiling that um, was showing what was happening in the space. And so once it got dark outside, people could kind of see what was happening remotely. And this is a little bit of a movie of it. It's just a little bit of a clip. Um, and then I just want to thank some people. I really want to thank Johnny and you guys and Ted and everything. And then just also, we, we owe a debt of gratitude to the people that go to Railroad Square on First Friday and participate with our work. And you can see, I don't know if you've noticed, but in some of these videos, you see a lot of, um, a few of the same people over and over. So we do have some fans that come back uh, and we really really appreciate them and thank you guys very much
Thank you all.